That's after Patrick Moore has found himself in the rarefied atmosphere of the Andes in Chile to visit one of the world's major observatories, which trains its telescopes into the sky at night. I'm standing in the middle of the Atacama Desert in Chile, and I can assure you it's a pretty wild and desolate place. It extends for more than 3,000 miles. There are a few local settlements inhabited by Indians, and you can hardly call them towns, I think, and the nearest town of any size, La Serena, is over 60 miles away. High above me, along this steep, winding road, is the mountain of La Silla, rising to nearly 8,000 feet above sea level. What you'll see there is a cluster of domes, because Mount Sia is the home of one of the world's major observatories. It's known officially as the European Southern Observatory, because it's run by most of the European nations, except, um, I'm sorry to say, Britain. You may ask, why is the observatory here? And the answer is quite simple, because seeing conditions here are superb. Also, since we're about 30 degrees south of the equator, we have the advantage of the far southern stars, which we, from Britain, can never see. The whole idea of combined southern station goes back to 1954, but it wasn't until the late 1960s that La Silla was fully operational. The ESO actually owns the site. It was bought for the princely sum of $10,000, all 625 square kilometers of it. The largest telescope of the observatory is the 3.6 meter reflector, but there are plenty of others, and in point of fact, there are 15 domes spread over a wide area. This group of telescopes behind me is known here as the Small Telescope Group, though, frankly, by my modest standards, the telescopes there aren't small at all. They are all reflectors, of course, and their apertures range between 50 centimetres up to as much as one metre. Then there are the larger telescopes, the one-and-a-half-metre spectrographic, the one-and-a-half-metre Danish telescope, the Schmidt, and the two giants, the 3.6-metre and the 2.2 Max Planck telescope together with the remarkable structure housing the revolutionary NTT, or New Technology Telescope, about which we'll be saying more in a few moments. Radio astronomy is also studied from here, and we have a radio telescope. It has a 15-metre dish, and is used mainly at sub-millimetre wavelengths, of tremendous value in telling us more about various stages in the life cycles of the stars. But, of course, here at La Silla, the main emphasis is upon optical astronomy. Well, the main reason why this place has been chosen, you know, we located here about uh, 100 kilometers north of the city of Serena, and it's the, what we call the Norte Chico, the small north of Chile, is precisely that, because the atmospheric conditions and the seeing conditions are absolutely exceptional, among the best in the world. What happens, unfortunately, we are in the last 20, 30 meter of the light coming from millions and millions of light years, we degrade the seeing conditions. And uh, we have done also some studies about finding out why do we degrade this. We know for obvious reasons are, of course, that we uh, generate far too much heat inside the telescopes. We have some chimney effects creating turbulences, and that by, uh, degrades the image conditions. And one way to fight this is, of course, to have all the heavy equipment on the south of the, of the telescope in an auxiliary building. Most of our winds, predominant winds, come from the north, and uh, the heat is blown away to south, and the telescope optics do not see that. Well, certainly up here the conditions are pretty good. What about the actual instrumentation? Well, all the instrumentation keeps changing according to the scientific program, and uh, we typically deal with something like uh, 350 different scientific programs a year. Uh, ESO has an enormous demand and there is an enormous pressure factor on our instrumentation. On the larger the instrumentation, we have about three times as many demands as observing time available. So uh, you can also imagine that once the time is allocated to a specific observer, uh, it's not very likely that he would be happy to come down here for a short time and find that the instrumentation is not working. <laughs> that creates enormous pressure on us, of course. Near the astronomers, we have a large crew of 
technical people which have to cover a very large range of uh, technology from electronic uh, software, mechanics, uh, cryogenics, detectors, also a large wavelength range because our instrumentation goes from ultraviolet to near infrared. I think uh, La Silla is like a hospital in a way. Uh, we run round the clock and round the year. We never stop. I mean, we're observing in daytime. In case of infrared, we can observe, as a matter of fact, 24 hours a day. In the case of the uh, millimeter, the radio telescope, it's just the same. And uh, I think that brings, of course, uh, an, an over-strong constraint on the operations here. I mean, largely we have to rely on the uh, capacity and on the goodwill on the motivation of the people. And uh, that's, I think, at the end, is the largest and major challenge we have to face here. This part of Chile isn't exactly overpopulated. Who lived here before the astronomers came? Well, that's a difficult question, but if you walk a few hundred meters down the hill, you will find uh, some clear traces of erosions. A few hundred years, probably four or five hundred years ago, we must have a tremendous amount of rain since some Indians were living here. As a matter of fact, they left some stone carvings and uh, which we haven't been able to decipher yet. Because what you see is some primitive waveforms, some sine waves, which end up with a sun or with some animals on one side. Animals and human beings as well. These people must have been the first astronomers. Although an astronomer may come to an observatory for only a few nights to observe some particular object or group of objects, many projects are long term. One very long-term project is a complete survey of the southern sky. And much of the photography is being carried out here with the one-meter Schmidt telescope. Dr. Richard West has been involved with this project for over 15 years. Would you tell us a bit about the southern sky survey? Oh, yes. That all started quite some time ago in the late 60s when ESO came into being. There were two main instruments, the 3.6 meter and the Schmidt telescope. And the idea was that the Schmidt telescope would survey the southern sky and find all those interesting objects which would later be observed with a 3.6 meter telescope. Why is the Schmidt show particularly well adapted for this kind of work? Well, the Schmidt is in fact a gigantic photographic camera with a field of about five degrees square. And uh, it photographs very, very faint objects and does so very fast. So in fact, you can cover the whole sky within a few years. Uh, we started in 1972 and uh, the plates which we used were quite good. Actually, we were able to see objects which were about 100 times fainter than anything which had ever been seen before in the southern sky. So you can imagine that it was just a gold mine which we kept digging in for several years until we had other people doing so. We found more than 15,000 galaxies, lots of open clusters, a few comets, minor planets, of course, by the uh, hundreds, and uh, many, many other things. So we should not forget that uh, the Southern Sky Survey is really a collaboration between ESO and the SERC in the UK. Uh, we divided the task because it was really a large one so that the blue plates were taken in Australia with the UK Schmidt and we took the red plates here. Apart from recording objects so faint that they haven't been photographed before, what basically do you hope to learn from this survey? Well, a southern sky survey is really to find out what you see in the southern sky. So I think to answer the question would be almost impossible. But as I said before, first of all, we want to find those objects which are interesting and which will give us something to think about, which may provide new insights into physics and so on. But at the same time, we also want to do statistics to see how many stars do we have in which direction, how is the Milky Way built in the southern part of it, we want to look at the center of the Milky Way and see what is in there and so on. And of course, the Magellanic Clouds are extremely important and there has really been done a lot of work in those clouds with this instrument. One thing does strike me, you're doing this work with photography. And nowadays, we are always hearing that photography is on the way out and electronic devices are taking over. Yes, uh, I agree to that because those electronic devices are more sensitive. They are better to catch photons than the photographic plate. But uh, photography may even be on its way back because we have recently learned about new emulsions which are more sensitive, that means they are faster, and therefore they can show fainter objects than those emulsions which we had until now. And we have also just finished building a completely new machine for developing the plates which will somehow pull out more information from these plates 
and therefore also allow us to see objects which are fainter. It works in the way that we take the plate out of the telescope and we put it into a tray in a horizontal position. Then we close a lid over this plate and on the lid is fixed a grid, like in the refrigerator. And the grid moves very, very quickly back and forth, very closely to the plate. And uh, through this, we have a very strong agitation. And in that way, the plate is developed better than before. There is only one problem, namely that the distance is only one millimeter between the plate and the grid. And if something should go wrong, we may lose a plate. Was this actually developed here at the ESO? Yes, this was developed in Gashing at the headquarters of ESO and installed here at the mountain uh, recently. The other major telescope used in the Southern Sky Survey is also the largest of the telescopes here at La Silla, the 3.6 meter. When it was built in the early 70s, that is more than 15 years ago, uh, there was no big telescope in Europe. And uh, when it was installed here in 1976, it was indeed the biggest European instrument. Uh, there are several foci. The most important is the prime focus, which is up top in the instrument, where you uh, do the observations which really require all photons you can, you can gather. But the prime focus is no longer used for the astronomer. He's no longer riding up there because we have remote control, and that is all being done from the control room, which is next to here. Uh, we use the Cassegrain focus that is down below the main mirror and at this moment there is a big camera installed which is being used to observe extremely faint galaxies. There is also a third focus which is down below the floor. We cannot see it but uh, in this there is a very large spectrograph which gives an extremely high resolution. Uh, now in order to use that spectrograph most of the time it was decided to build a small telescope next to this one in another dome just outside and it is called the CAT which is the Coude auxiliary telescope and it feeds light into the big spectrograph so that you can use it almost every time. Now what exactly are the main programs being carried out at the moment with this telescope? Well as I said before it is the biggest telescope and therefore you use this telescope for anything which you cannot do with the other telescopes and that includes first of all uh, when you observe the faintest objects which you can observe at all that is also the most remote for instance very distant quasars clusters of galaxies or whatever you have out there but I think it has also become rather interesting recently with the infrared techniques which have become much better for instance a spectrograph was built by ESO it is called the Earthspec, the infrared spectrograph and it is being used to obtain spectra out in the infrared region. Uh, that spectrograph rides in the Cassegrain cage below the mi main mirror and uh, it also gives us the possibility to look into the clouds where young stars are being born. Well this of course is a massive telescope on an equatorial mount. It's, I suppose it's one of the last or the last generation telescopes really. Yes and some people call it the last dinosaur but uh, I don't think that is really correct because it is a very good telescope. The 3.6 meter is a splendid telescope and it's conventional with regard to design and the dome. But now we've come to the era of telescopes built on a rather different pattern. And we have one of these at La Silla, high on the hill behind me, the NTT, or New Technology Telescope. The building is built around the telescope. And uh, this, of course, gives a couple of problems. Indeed, since you can turn the building eternally, you have to take in all the electrical power by slip rings, but uh, this has been done and it also works very well. There are lots of computers and I don't know how many hundreds of motors driving the whole complex. Uh, and of course, uh, there is no way of using it in, in the old-fashioned manner. Everything is done by computer. There are a number of features in this telescope which are entirely new. And the first one, and I think the most obvious, is that the telescope is smaller and the building is smaller. This is done so because we want the air around the telescope to be more stable, to be more quiet, and therefore the images will be more sharp. When you have sharper images, you can see more things, you can see farther out in space. But that is just one of the new things. Another one, and I think perhaps the most important one, is that this telescope incorporates the new concept of active optics. That means that the main mirror, which is 3.6 meter in diameter, is actively controlled by a computer. It is a rather thin mirror and therefore also rather light, and it would flex if 
we just left it all by itself. But it is supported by 78 supports, which are computer controlled. And by watching the image of a star all the time, we can actually correct the shape of the mirror so that this image will always be as sharp as possible. And this is very important. But there is another feature which is, I would say, a little in the future, but which will also be incorporated here, and that is called adaptive optics. And that means that you have a small mirror just in front of the instrument on the telescope, which will move very quickly and which will eliminate the motions in the atmosphere so that the image of a star or the galaxy or something else will always be as good as possible. Actually, it will almost be as if the telescope here is out in space, outside the Earth's atmosphere. So those are very important new features. Then there is another one, which I think the astronomers will like, and that is that the telescope has fixed instrumentation. There will be no changes of instruments. They will all be fixed to the telescope in the so-called Nasmith focus, that is, on either side of the telescope fork. On one side will be the optical instrumentation, and on the other side we will have it for the infrared region. So by just flipping a mirror, we can switch the telescope from the optical region into the infrared region. We will have remote control of this instrument, like we already have for two other telescopes on La Silla. That means that the astronomer can stay in Europe and control this instrument completely just via a satellite link, and therefore he need no longer travel to Chile. But I would agree that some astronomers would find that it would be nice to come here once in a while. What major programs are going to be undertaken with the telescope? Anything which you can't do with other telescopes in the world. Everything which is just beyond the horizon now will be watched with this instrument because it will be slightly better, perhaps even a bit better, than every other telescope which is on the ground here. So far, is everything going well? Yes, uh, we are now in the final stages of committing this instrument to operation and uh, I think it is correct to say that everything so far has gone well and uh, I think there is every hope that this telescope will be a major asset of world's astronomy in the future. The NTT is the latest addition to the group of telescopes here. As we've seen, it includes various new features. And many of these are the prototypes for the design of the next major instrument to be set up by the European Southern Observatory, the VLT, or Very Large Telescope. A telescope is uh, basically an uh, equivalent 16-meter aperture telescope. It consists of uh, four different elements, four telescopes of 8-meter mirror and uh, with a combined focus of these 8 meter mirrors gives us an equivalent of the aperture of 60 meter. I know that forecasting is always a very dangerous business but have you any real idea when it's going to be ready? We expect that the first element of the VLT would be operational. I mean the first telescope should be operational in 1995 and I guess by the turn of the century, the beginning of the next century we should certainly have the four elements together. That belongs to the future. Something you may think belongs to the past is Halley's Comet, about which we heard so much a few years ago. Well, it may surprise you to know that here at La Silla it is still being tracked. At the moment, inside the dome of the Danish 1.5 meter telescope, they're making preparations to see whether they can record it. And um, during the night, we're going to join them. When we observe Halley, the first thing we have to do is to find it, and that is not very easy. We know, of course, its orbit quite well, uh, to within a few thousand kilometers, but the object is so faint that we cannot really see it. As a matter of fact, at this moment, it is uh, more than 60 million times fainter than what you can see with the naked eye. So we have to point the telescope with great accuracy, and that takes some time. It would be as if we were trying to observe the Little Mermaid in Copenhagen here from Chile just in the reflected sunlight. That is about the same thing, so it is not easy. Uh, we have to use the most modern detectors to do it, and uh, the one we use here is called a CCD. A CCD is a uh, new thing. We only have it for about five or eight years, but it lets us see very faint objects. Uh, it consists of a number of diodes, there are about 300 by 500, and uh, we uh, uh, integrate, that's what we say when we do an exposure, 
for long times, in this case for Halley, we need about 30 minutes integration before we are able to see it on the screen. And yet we are not quite sure before we have seen it. So it's by no means as um, a straightforward as just taking a snapshot? No, I would say that it is uh, probably one of the most difficult observations you can do because the comet moves during the exposure and that means that the telescope must follow the motion of the comet but you cannot see the comet at all. So it is a blind offset, it is a blind motion of the telescope and uh, if everything is alright it's fine but it's, it may also go wrong. Well obviously as the comet goes further and further away from the sun it's going to get less active. Is there any activity going on there now? Yes, and that was a great surprise because most people had expected that comet to turn off, that is to remain inactive when it passed the orbit of Jupiter. But now we are beyond Saturn and uh, it looks as if it is still active. You started this integration some time ago. How long is it going to take? Uh, this one is uh, 30 minutes and then it will take another, uh, say, a minute to read out the signal from the chip from the CCD. Now we are reading the image. That takes some time. Yeah. That's it. And then we, uh, we write the image to tape to be sure that we don't lose it. And once that is done, we shall have a look at the image on the screen. And here it comes. And where is the comet? That's a good question. There it is. You see it? Yes, indeed. Th that is a comet. There it is. That's the one. But uh, I think we should we should see a close up of it to be sure. So now we just enlarge that small area and put it on the screen. I think <laughs> now there is no doubt. Huh? That's that's the comet here, and the white lines are the stars. That is probably a galaxy, by the way, up here. Can you see any indication of a tail? Well, I can see the dust cloud, which is around it. I think on the color screen, it is even easier to see it up there. The brownish red around it, that's all the dust cloud. And then the blue here is the background, the sky. So it is quite easy to see the comet. And of course, the stars are white here again. It's all false color. Though. Yes, indeed. It's only to be able to see it. And what can you tell so far from this image? Well, I can tell Halley is still there, and I yes. think that is the most important. And uh, for me, the most important is perhaps that apparently the telescope was pointing in the right direction, because you could never be sure before you have it in the field, but it is there. So now I shall continue do, to do integrations, to do exposures all through the night. And by the end of the night, I hope to have about five hours together. Uh, then all the pictures will be put together and will be cleaned so that you get a real image of the comet, which will then allow you to study, say, the amount of dust around it, to study the brightness of the nucleus, and therefore perhaps to find out how it rotates, because that is still the major unsolved question in connection with Halley. When we began the Sky at Night series, a little over 30 years ago, this observatory didn't exist. There was nothing here except virtually uninhabited desert. Things are very different today, and La Silla is one of the greatest and most modern observatories in the entire world. Obviously, we've only been able to touch on a few of the programs and show you one or two of the telescopes, but enough, I think, to show the immense amount of work that's being carried on. And there's no doubt that in the coming years, La Silla will continue to play an absolutely vital part in the development of modern astronomy.